My name is Richard Casper. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I teach the course here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. This program started basically because after my injuries in war, I didn't know how to deal with myself. I came back, had a brain injury, my best friend was shot and killed. I didn't know myself at that point. Art has helped me by giving me a chance to have a voice again. I used to not be able to leave my house. I couldn't go talk to people. I would physically throw up and get sick. If you could be 0% that's committing suicide, 100% being the best you can be. After the Marine Corps, after being injured, I was at probably like a nine or a 10. And after the school, I was back to like 85% me. For people who may struggle like I did and didn't want to break out of the house and be like, I'm not sure if this is gonna work. I just want them to know my story and be able to come out here and learn with other combat vets how to do art and if they're looking for one more way, if they just come out here and give me a chance, it's going to be worth it. What we were aiming for is to express what we were dealing with, you know, when we were deployed and during our military career, where we literally get out of our element, go on this kind of like alternate reality to go back in time, think about what we went through and express it to other people. Just being exposed to different concepts of art, like at the museum and some of the contemporary art we saw, um, that's what influenced me to try doing a performance piece for my last project. The opportunity to be at the school was just phenomenal. It was amazing. We could, at lunch, we could go and wander the halls of the museums and that was, that was pretty awesome. I think the hardest part was actually talking about what I've been through with it was easy talking to Richard because he is a combat veteran and he has been through stuff I've been through. And My job was to you know, go find IEDs or find landmines or anti-personnel landmines and take them apart. And little did I know, I was putting that stuff inside me. At first it's a little hard to let yourself become vulnerable. Um, you won't really know what to do right away. It takes a couple days. I know for me it took a week. Being surrounded by a bunch of veterans that like know what combat feels like, knows the after effects of combat, knows how it feels to come home. It was really comfortable being here. They're gonna come to class like normal college students, treated like normal people, that know how to be like, I can be in college, I am a normal person, and I could live like everybody else lives. If even one of them chose to go to college and study art and has that artist brain to where it saved them, it's totally worth it. Hey everybody, how are you? Hi Erin, hi Kyle. So I'm Mrs. Zoe F5 and uh, Queen Cass is hosting on Twitch. Thank you so much for that, I appreciate it. Hey Cass. Um, so I am in the middle of doing a series of geode paintings. Here's the one we'll be working on today. Um, and as I work on this, I wanted to talk about, uh, um, you know, like where to start, right? I think a lot of times I was, I've been watching, um, I watch a lot of different artists' streams. I really enjoy it. I mean, obviously, it's something that I do. Um, I'm very passionate about it. And I listen to artists all the time um, talk about how they've made uh, the, same, the same kind of art, the same piece of art. Hey, OEF. Um, over and over again, right? Uh, I think that uh, a lot of times we retell our stories over and over again as part of the process. Um, but sometimes, for some of us, it's a struggle to start. Because as you start creating something, you may not like it, right? You may not, the more you look at this painting, what do you think it looks like, oh yeah? Um, and I hear artists you know, say it's not good enough, it's not good enough, I don't like this, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it kind of looks like a phoenix. 
Um, and I think that we kind of hinder our own progress when we do that. So as I'm working on this today, I kind of wanted to talk about that with you guys. Maleficent. Maleficent's a dragon? Or are you talking about Ursula's hair, maybe? I can see how this would look like Maleficent's dragon. <laughs> Ursula's hair, I can see that too, yeah. That's funny. So, I decided I was gonna make a geode painting. I really, really enjoy um, patterns, right? So, I have here in the studio, some slices of carnelian, right? Got to get that camera to not focus on everything else. Those are, these are my coasters. This is what I used to put my drinks on. See all those little lines right there, those patterns? So one of the things that I did, uh, as a coping mechanism before I was diagnosed with PTSD is I counted things. And it's really, really common. <clears throat> I didn't know it was common at the time. I thought it was weird. But I counted things constantly. I counted telephone poles when we were driving. I counted, you know, rings, uh, lines in wood grain, uh, everything, right? And then I found, uh, when I started creating things that what I did was I started duplicating patterns. So that same process that created that coping skill in my brain to count things, to calm me, I used within my art. And it's, it was a real big disconnect for me to realize that I was doing that, right? So part of my story is the numerous years that I spent counting. Right. It's calming to do it, right? It takes your head off of whatever it is that you're doing. And you can just zone and count for a second. Um, but I find that I incorporate that in my art. I create things that have line work or different pieces that can be counted. And I do it all the time, right? Because it's soothing to me. This is soothing to me. So as I'm making these, it isn't an obvious story, right? It isn't a, a picture of me as a child and what I was going through. It isn't a graphic example. However, it is part of my story that has taken, I, I can't imagine if I were to add up how many hours I've spent counting, uh, how big of a part of my life that really is. So as I'm making this, this piece of art, uh, it doesn't look like it's part of a story, but it is. And it doesn't matter if the rest of the world sees this as part of my story. I know this. I know that this is a useful skill. I know that this is a tool I've used my whole life and I know why I use it. And acknowledging that and putting it into a new image um, is something that I find very soothing and that I really enjoy and it helps me to process everything else, right? It helps me to get out the rest of my story because if I tell this piece, even if it's not overtly, even if no one else hears it, I'm telling the story to myself. So it's one of the reasons why the art that I make and the different things that I do don't necessarily look like a, uh, hey Dan, um, and a, 
an, an actual story, I guess. They're not telling a story. But if you put all those pieces together through all the years, you'll find there's a lifetime there. But it's my story for me. So, like I said, one of the things I wanted to talk with you today, is that something that you do when you look at art? Are you creating pieces of your story that you may not even be aware of until you look at it as a whole collection? Do you tell little pieces at a time? Is that easier? Do you break it into chunks? Or do you just create to be creating? So what we're gonna do right now is I have acrylic paint markers. <clears throat> uh, we've done an acrylic pour on this canvas. I have added uh, some amethyst stones, some quartz and, and uh, rose quartz crystals to it. And I'm gonna do the line work. I'm gonna do all the details today. Oh, and by the way, this little piece right here, this little bonus canvas, I should probably show you that before I start. I don't wanna dry out my pen. Uh, this is, I wish I could show you, I wish I could show you on camera what this looks like, really. So, I have an acrylic paint that is silver, and it's called Extreme Glitter. It's holographic. Can you see that shine? That's not from the light, that's actually in the painting. And it collected here along this dark purple, here along this corner right here, there's some shine up there. There's a little line of it down here. But I love the details of this. And then you've got that high shine that comes through there in the center. So I literally created this painting with the leftover paints from this painting. And it's something that I really enjoy. I really, really like the idea that when I've finished a piece, when something's completed, right? And I'm about to walk away from it, right? So this is done, it's finished. I'm gonna put it in the store and it's over. Hey, Enigma, welcome. That there's still more, right? There's still more to be told. I think it's very indicative of how my life has gone. When I've closed a door, there's still more, right? When something's over, there's still something new. So I love that, that part of the process. <clears throat> but this uh, Geode series, we're probably gonna be doing all month long. We started with one in Malachite. And this is it finished. Right, so it's been clear coated. And along the stones, you'll see there's a clear three dimensional sheen there. I'm using something called dimensional magic to get that effect in those stones and make them very shiny and wet looking. So there's our first malachite one. And then this one will be amethyst to go with it. And then we're going to continue to make four more all with different stones. And today I'm gonna to do this line work. So I love the abstractness of an acrylic pour. I like some of the details that you can get. These details in the center are amazing. I have to be careful picking this up because these stones are not fully adhered. But this effect in there is really, really nice. But I wanna add some finer details, right? And I'm gonna start with black. 
and work along the outside of the center. And then we're going to uh, get all of these stones adhered. <laughs> and then if these acrylic paint pens uh, dry soon enough, we will start on uh, the clear coat, but it is possible that they won't be dry enough to do it. So we'll see how that goes by end of stream. So have any of you ever really wanted to paint or draw or do anything but didn't think you had the talent to do it? Didn't think you'd be able to? Like what stops you from creating? What do you think, Dan? Is there something that stops you? Is there something that slows you down? Right, not good enough. Very hard to watch an artist that you believe is uh, somehow more talented or skilled than you and hear them say they're not good enough. That is something that has hindered me for years. <laughs> because if they're not good enough, I certainly can't be good enough, right? I mean, what chance would I have? <coughs> so I guess the question you have to ask yourself is who does it really have to be good for, right? Let me zoom this in a little bit so you can see the details that we're creating. Won't be able to see the whole thing but you'll at least get to see what that's starting to shape up as, what that's starting to look like. it takes real bravery to start the first time and decide that it's okay if it's I mean who does it have to be good enough for you general public comparing yourself to somebody else I mean so often like I said you're you're telling your own story it isn't anybody else's and it doesn't matter what medium you choose. 
in some manner your eye, your brain has created what you've made and it is your story. set that down for a second. I think I would like a bolder black through here. Got to pick a medium that works for you, digital arc or stream because I can zoom, right? Yeah, you got to work within your limitations, right? Work within your abilities, um, definitely, and with what you're comfortable with. I mean, thank you, Lady Brittany. Once we get this line work in here, I think it'll be very nice. I think it'll really add to it. Just trying real hard not to lay my hand on these crystals because they are not fully adhered to this canvas. And I don't want to move them off of the paint. So I'm at a very awkward, yes, I agree, zooming in is very handy. I'm at an awkward angle doing this. Ah, there goes one. That's what we didn't want to do. These canvases are just a tiny bit too big for my space. <laughs> That's all right. We can wiggle it around. I don't know that I want too much more dark in here. I think I'd like to work up here in this corner a little bit. Scooch my keyboard and mouse over here. Try and get that out of the way.
I really like the coloration in this corner. It's very pretty. I'm going to have to turn it all the way around. To be able to do this without knocking these rocks off in here. going on today there you go now you guys can see this has anybody ever used acrylic paint markers it's the same acrylic paint that I I painted on this canvas just in marker form. <laughs> I love working with markers. like coloring, right? I really like how they flow. And more than anything, I like how they dry. because they are acrylic paint, so they dry just like the paint on the canvas. And it's really nice. They're very relaxing. Like this is very calming to me. I don't know, Dan. The universal question. I feel that way about most fast food. One thing is good and everything else is awful. <laughs> One of my daughters, you may know her as Mini OEF5, 
we'll hit two or three restaurants and buy fries from one restaurant and a sandwich from a different restaurant and a drink from another one <laughs> or dessert from another one <laughs> because she <laughs> she doesn't like all the things. right I do not have time to uh, spoil myself in that way I don't think but I think it's funny that she does it It amazes me how much this detailing will change this painting. It suddenly looks so much more like a geode now, doesn't it? It does to me anyway. Excuse me. There we go, I think that's quite nice. Let's see about doing this corner over here. I'm gonna zoom you out just a little bit so you can see more of what we're doing on this end. Do you guys hear this marker against this canvas? The 
the scritchy scritch sound that it makes. It seems very, very loud to me. It may not be to you. My sleeve and stuff. What, you can hear the mic hitting my sleeve? I can move that so that doesn't happen. It's funny because you know the sound of uh, a chalkboard or whatever. It's incredibly irritating to me, like makes, just sets my teeth on edge. And for some reason, I like this sound. And you would think it would be the opposite. So I think I'm going to go light in here. I think I'm going to go light purple on top of that. Okay, good. Yeah, let me know if there's something like that going on and I don't know it. I cannot hear myself right now, as you guys can. So stuff like that's happening, I, I don't always know. But it is easy to fix. So what stone should our next geode be? On What the Craft Wednesday on my own stream, which is Mrs. Zoya 5 on Twitch, um, Lady Brittany had asked that I do uh, blue tones, like maybe a malachite or a lapis lazuli or a blue howlite or, not malachite, I'm sorry, uh, or a turquoise. And we can do a blue one next. I'd like to do a ruby or garnet one, do one in reds. Uh, maybe a carnelian one in oranges and golds. Gallstones. Uh, oh, well, I have amber. <laughs> 
Do they look like amber? A pebble one. Fair enough. <laughs> Can you imagine? How would you feel about me if I just pulled out a box of gallstones like I've been collecting them from people? Wouldn't you just be like, uh... <laughs> Mrs. I didn't mean it. <laughs> this purple is the exact same color as my paint. Not going to be able to see this line at all until the light hits it. It's a secret one. There'll be a secret line in here. Yeah, I like that very much. You would judge me. I would judge me for that. I would 100% judge me for that. Right? I have them in the basement cranking out gallstones for my art projects. <laughs> That's not right. Poor guy. I just knocked that same stone down. on my floor somewhere. So that will be fun to find. Mr. Cass is like, yup. Yup, that's who he is. So for those of you who have not met me before, I am Mrs. OEF5, stands for Operation Enduring Freedom 5. My husband, OEF5, is a veteran and uh, was in service in Afghanistan for the fifth rotation of troops that went over with Operation Enduring Freedom, it's where we take our names from. And he streams uh, on Twitch as well. 
Um, one of the interesting things that has happened is that instead of people calling him OEF5, or some people call him Outlaw because he was part of the Outlaws, uh, they call him Mr. because my name is Mrs. And it's become a running joke because he takes umbrage at it because I took my name from him and he did not take his name from me. <laughs> but that's fun, right? That's all part of it. All part of it. No different than... When he was in before they medically retired him, the, uh, the jokes were constant. And it'll probably continue for the rest of our lives. Of course, we've managed to surround ourselves with really good people who understand us. Yes, walnuts are bitter is a great example. Isn't it amazing how that detailing can change this whole picture? I think it's looking more and more like a geode to me. I love the details. The perfect line you can get with these markers. And still have it be acrylic paint that has the same same weight on the canvas. How many chairs now, Ray? Yes, my husband has uh, managed to break a few chairs in his life. And I have managed to tell horrible stories about him. We've been married a long time. and Obviously, telling our stories is important to me. I think everyone should be free enough to be able to tell their stories, to be able to share. Let people understand what you've seen, what you've experienced, so that they can grow from your knowledge. Even if it's just laughing, even if it's just funny stuff. we share who we are with people, the more we learn who we are, no matter how you do it. Feeling spine, falling spine first on a background. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes, that would hurt. Falling off roofs hurts. Dan, <laughs> why? 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 Parkour. Seven pounds of boot on each leg. Bad idea. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine.
right. I'm going to leave that red, that red as it is, I think. Uh, but I am going to come through this silver and through this white with some purple. You want to break that up just a little bit. Just want to break it up and accent some of these colors that are in here. Some of these lines. That's very nice. So something that I do with every piece of art that I make in order to break a habit that I had as a younger artist is I find something that I love about it and I express that out loud every time, right? Because I want to teach my brain that it's okay to love my art. It's okay to like it. It's okay to be proud of this part of the story that I've told. It's okay to understand that I've survived something, I've been through something, and that this is a painting that demonstrates a piece of that. So rather than say, I'm not good enough, right? Like we had talked about before, which hindered me I now make sure for every piece that I make, I tell myself what's good. I tell myself what I like. A couple of reasons for that, actually. One of the added benefits of doing that is that I then realize what it is that I like, and I can attempt to duplicate what I think is good because I've taken the time to acknowledge what is good about something, right? Rather than just what isn't good about something. And the other added benefit to it is that after a while, my brain starts to look for what's good instead of what I don't like. Instead of picking out the imperfections the one stone that has come off of this, for instance. Right? There was a day 
that that would greatly bother me, that I would have had to have stopped what I was doing, search for it, find it right now, fix it, lose any ideas I already had in my head about what I wanted to create, what I wanted to do. And I would get distracted because it's imperfect. And I try very hard not to do that now. <laughs> I mean, mind you, I am going to find that stone and we are going to put it back. But it doesn't have to hinder my progress when I'm in a moment. And I'm doing something, right? It doesn't have to be distracting to me by the time I finish this painting. But it can be. I do definitely think that it helps with progress if I don't let it be, though. Right? Oh, I think our line work is done. You guys want an up close personal look at some of this line work? See how much those details add depth? It almost looks like a valley, right? It almost looks like a topographical painting right there. So we've incorporated, I can't move it too much because all those stones will fall off, but we've incorporated all that same color, but new color to different parts of the painting. Yeah, I like the depth it gives. So the nice thing about this is that in person, <laughs> it looks entirely different than it does on camera. On camera, you can't see that there are um, four different kinds, five, six different additives on top of this paint or in the paint, right? So there's a deep purple glitter. There are pieces of cellophane, amethyst, obviously. There are tiny pieces of, of straight little purple shards that are holographic. Uh, there's some more purple glitter. There's the crystal quartz and the rose quartz, which are really cool because they're actually picking up the color of the paint behind them. So from this camera angle, it looks like this is pink and then it slowly goes into purple, right? One of the things I was so happy about as we started to add that crystal quartz, which is clear, and the rose quartz, which is pink, is that you get the same effect of an amethyst geode where it goes from the white to a purple to a darker color inside, right? <laughs> But if you look really close at them, you'll see those are clear and pink stones and they're just reflecting the color that's underneath them. So for those stones, it's all about the placement of where, where they lie in the paint that gave them that color, which is a pretty cool effect. And amethyst, of course, is just amethyst. It's just going to be amethyst. So we're going to go ahead and set these stones. Yeah, this, these sections, these dark purple, and this is all dark purple. There's no black in it. Um, they really, it, it really, yeah, it really does, it, it, it definitely, definitely has a depth to it. 
you can see the layers of paint. Um, I am using something called dimensional magic to adhere these stones. Um, not only will it adhere them, but it dries perfectly clear, very, very shiny, and will create, it's dimensional, meaning it won't lay down flat, it won't bleed out, right? It'll stay fairly thick and around these stones, so it'll create like a river look around them, right? The thing about uh, geodes is they're usually polished, crystal, very shiny, very slick looking. And these little stones, these amethysts, have all been um, tumbled, so they have that same shine. But I didn't want them to look like individual stones on the canvas. I want them to look like a solid piece of a geode, right? So in order for them to be perfectly adhered, for one thing, because this is going to hang on somebody's wall and I don't want anything to fall off of it, um, and for them to look like a single piece in this painting, like they belong, like they go here, I wanted to use this product to give it the right texture, just a little bit more depth, right? This is definitely, definitely a, a multimedia painting. So this, this dimensional magic is thick enough that if it gets bubbles in it, they stay. <laughs> and it's very hard to get them out, like they don't want to pop. and I don't want them in there. I can't even pop them with my finger. So I move them around with a needle, right? So I can get them high enough on the stone. And <laughs> then when I touch them with my finger, they'll pop. But I have to get enough product off the top of the bubble so that it'll pop when I touch it. And then I have to get this stuff off my fingers, like as soon as humanly possible. Okay, so now we have to do the same thing with the quartz. So in a month or so, once we finish this project, Uh, I do believe we will, um, we'll put these in the store, but I do believe uh, I'm going to rearrange the studio a little bit and uh, create a gallery wall behind me so that I can hang these and some of the other works that I have that are in the store up uh, so you guys can see them. And then 
uh, as things sell, as I make new things, uh, we'll just continue to change out that wall. Yeah, I like how that looks. That's very nice. And like I said, this will all be crystal clear when it dries. It's cloudy right now, but it'll be crystal clear. So there we go. Geo painting number two. So our next one, uh, since I'm all out of gallstones, Dan, <laughs> never collected them to begin with. Please don't be creeped out. Uh, I guess we'll do the blue. We'll do blues. So do we want turquoise blues? Do you guys want to see the stones while this is setting up? I can't clear coat the rest of this canvas until this is set up enough that it's, um, it's got a little, I don't know, skin on the outside of it. That water has sat here long enough. It's warm, unfortunately. Okay, let me set this over here and let that just dry. Um, all right, so stone choices. I don't want to use any art glass. I absolutely want these to be in real stones. So in there is some turquoise. That's some lapis lazuli in there. <coughs> and I guess the highlight must, must be in that same one. It's your case. All right, so. I believe I have, I'm fairly certain I have more of this. This is kind of a uh, denim, well, you're gonna need both hands so it can focus. Kind of a denim color, right? It's got some darks and lights in it. Hey Khaleesi. We're picking out what geode stones we're gonna do for our next geode piece. This is lapis lazuli. This is one of my favorite stones. It has a lot a variety and depth of color. Right? So 
So we could do a geode painting that's lapis. We could do one that is that denim howlite. Uh, we could do one that is turquoise. And turquoise I have in either, these are round though, those aren't really going to work for a geode painting. I mean turquoise isn't like a geode stone. So it's a little more difficult. And everything I have with the turquoise is really large. Or very carved, right? I have lots of turquoise shapes, but these carved shapes, I don't know. I mean, I suppose we could do it. I like the chip beads. I like the rough, tumbled texture rather than, you know, something that's been created with these geode paintings. <laughs> but honestly, we could do something like that with the lighter turquoise because I've got this teal turquoise and then I've got this, this is, um, I mean, this is just turquoise. It's robin egg blue turquoise. Then I have pieces that are like this. Like this is gigantic. In order to adhere this to a canvas, I would have to wire wrap it on and support it. Like there's no way that would just hold there. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous stone though. Look at this piece of turquoise. Like it's stunning. But that's something we could do. It would definitely be different than the others. It's a thought. What do you guys think? <laughs> the lapis would be all um, deep blues, creamy whites and silvers, some gold. Lapis has little bits of gold and black that flakes through it. Can I get that to zoom in on that? Maybe. Can you see the gold flecks in that? Barely. Um, but it has such a, a depth of color, right? Like that lapis has a beautiful blue tone to it. So we could do that. It would be darker, uh, but we could bring in golds and creamy whites and uh, a bunch of really pretty blues and do that. Or we could do a turquoise one. What do you think? Which one would you like better? I'm still picking paint off my hands, aren't I? That dimensional magic is also on my hands. I should probably go wash that off before it gets too dry. What, you want a turquoise one, Lady Brittany? I prefer lapis myself. I wouldn't mind doing a canvas with a turquoise on it. I just don't know if those big chunks of stone should be part of this series. When all of the rest of them will be 
those little chip beads, you know what I mean? I don't know, I'm gonna think about it. Maybe we'll start a poll in the Discord. <laughs> we'll get votes in the Discord. People can think about that here. So I had thought about doing some line work on this one, but I don't think I will. I think I will leave it. I will leave it as it is. I wish the problem with this holographic, this little teeny tiny fine grain holographic paint and the camera is that the light catches it and then you can't see what I can see. Like you can literally see three tones of purple behind it. And then like down here, these little, these little dots that are on top of it, you get this high shine in the background and then that creamy white. I just cannot make this camera do this painting justice. It's just not going to happen. You're all right, Khaleesi. I'm just debating between the lapis lazuli painting or the turquoise painting because all of the other paintings will have chip beads in them and the turquoise, if I do it, would have large chunks of rock on, this, on the canvas. I love this one. I can't get over it. I really, really like it. And it was another bonus one, right? It was a bonus painting that I made out of, out of my leftover paint from another painting. I absolutely love it. You know what's amazing about this? <laughs> Up here you can see a tiny bit of it. There is like neon pink in this painting. Neon pink. And you, I mean, you just never know that it was there. Yeah, I'm really happy with it. So, Let's say I am just starting out. I've watched art shows and art videos and I've thought about doing something or I've tried drawing or I've done a couple of things but I've never really pursued it even though I'm interested for whatever reason, right? So, sitting around your house is whatever kind of paper that you may have, scrap paper, whatever. You probably have a pencil. And I can tell you that for years, while I was talking on the phone, yes, it was before cell phones, but whatever, I would draw little hearts and vines put little leaves coming off of them
little swirly shapes. I doodled, right? While talking on the phone or when I was distracted or whatever. And it's not particularly good. Not particularly bad either, but not particularly good. So is this art? Is that enough? I definitely think it's a start. <laughs> I think that uh, deciding that that's okay, that giving yourself permission to doodle, to draw, and to like it, it's okay to like it. I think it can lead to all kinds of different things, right? And like I said, it doesn't have to be great. This is a mechanical pencil that you buy Anywhere, right? School supplies. Scrap piece of paper. Start where you are. Start with what you have. and just draw whatever comes to you. And it doesn't matter whose art this compares to. It doesn't matter if there's another artist out there who draws the same thing as you and you may think it looks better, or yours looks worse or whatever. <laughs> because this is yours. And it's just as unique as you are. It doesn't even matter if other people see it. I mean, what if nobody ever likes it? Does that matter? I mean, there are several pieces that I've made that nobody's ever seen. okay because it's mine and eventually when I'm ready to tell that part of my story I will <laughs> so is that art is this any more art than that is? Does it matter what I draw if I'm telling my story? Does it matter what I paint? I mean, I guess the real question is, it's the process, right? It's getting there. Do you know how many eyes I've drawn, Dan, in my lifetime? Probably thousands.
probably thousands. Like I said before, artists retell their stories over and over and over again, right? My eyes and people's reactions to my eyes in my lifetime <laughs> is part of my story. And so I've drawn eyes over and over and over and over, thousands of them. And the more you draw, the easier it gets to draw an eye. It's not a perfect eye by any stretch of the imagination. It is, however, my own eye. I have drawn my own eye over and over and over again. And if this camera were good enough or close enough, you could see that I've almost memorized it, right? But it doesn't matter what you're drawing. I mean, I can tell you right now, uh, there's some things that I cannot draw. Uh, I'm sure there's a whole litany of animals that I can't draw, right? And I would say, I can't draw it. Like you just said, Dan, better eye than I can do. Don't tell yourself you can't do it, you can. You can. Check this out. <laughs> if I attempt to draw something I've never drawn before, with no picture reference, okay? So I'm just thinking to myself, yeah, this is what a, uh, this is what an armadillo looks like. <laughs> just from memory. I haven't seen an armadillo up close and personal uh, since I was oh maybe 10 or 12 And I don't believe I've ever, ever drawn one or attempted to draw one. Now be willing to bet that by the time I get this done, if we pull up a picture of an armadillo, it probably won't look a damn thing like that. But again, I would ask you, is that art? He kind of looks like he has a, a weird duck face. I don't know. I bet armadillos probably don't look like that. <laughs> so my point in this exercise is if I'm drawing something off the top of my head, 
something familiar to me, right? Taking into consideration that as a woman, I wore makeup every day for almost 30 years. And when you put makeup on your face, you don't look at your entire face, you look at each tiny part of your face. So I've literally stared into my own eyes for hours and hours and hours while putting on eyeshadow, eyeliner, mascara, whatever. This subject being very familiar to me, easy for me to draw, right? I have blue-gray eyes with dark gray striations through the centers of them, and I have almost black rings around the outside of of the blue of my eyes. And that's what that looks like. I gave myself more eyelashes than I have because, you know, I'm drawing and I can do what I want. I haven't seen an armadillo since I was 12. They may look nothing like that. But I didn't give myself a reference either. Right? So with these geode paintings, I have geodes literally all over this place, okay? I have sliced geodes, I have raw geodes. I have different crystals all over the studio. I have different stones all over the studio. Now I'm doing them in an abstract manner and I'm doing them with an acrylic pour technique or different techniques. So I have limited abilities, right, to control what the paint does but I like that lack of control. I like that chaos in the process. But I have references all around me. It makes it very easy to do something well when it's either well known or it's referenced. It's much harder to get something right and be happy with it yourself when you do it like this off the cuff. And I think a lot of times what we as artists do, particularly when we're starting out alone, if you're just at home by yourself doing this, um, is you attempt to draw from memory, and when it doesn't match, you find fault, right? So we become harder on ourselves than we have to be, I think. And then we do things like, well, this isn't really art. This doesn't really count. Right? You diminish your work. Graphic art is art. <coughs> you can. You can still find fault. It's all in your head, right? It's all in how you see things. It's all in how you talk to you. Um, painting. Everyone that I know considers painting in, in almost any form art. However, uh, sketching, coloring, um, cross stitch, crochet, quilting, digital art, graphic art, graphic design, um, wood burning, pyography, um, calligraphy. I think that art comes in thousands of different forms. And then we could get into music if you really wanted to as well because that, of course, opens in a million more doors. But there's also poetry. There's also literature, storytelling. It's endless when you think about it. And when you think about it, not as it applies to you, but as it applies to other people, I think we're much more forgiving So I try to take myself out of that mindset every now and then and remember this is just as much a piece of art as this could be if I finished it. It would be a strange composition with a giant eye, a scribble, and a strange duck-faced armadillo, but, you know. Art doesn't have to make sense to everybody. It has to make sense to you. Right? All right, I am going to grab a colder water because I really am thirsty. 
And then I'm going to pull this other painting back over here, see if this uh, has adhered those stones and if we can continue to do a clear coat or if I'm going to have to let it dry overnight. So give me just a couple of minutes and I'll be right back. And then we'll grab that painting and bring it back over here. Okay? Okay, so my search for cold water was fruitless and my ice machine is locked up. So that didn't work, but that's okay. I'll be all right. My little doodles, we'll get those out of the way. Let's see if this is starting to dry enough to be clear and if it is, well, I can tell you that that part's not because I just touched it. Yeah, it's still pretty opaque.
I had hoped that we would be able to clear coat the rest of this painting. But if I touch this anywhere, it will drag. And I don't want it to be I don't want that thickness anywhere else on the painting except for around these stones. You guys see how thick that is? How it stands up and doesn't move? Really great stuff. That will all be clear. Oh, here, I have an example right here. The same thing. was used on this. See how they look like a shiny, wet river of stone? I need it to look much more like that before we can continue to clear coat this painting. So we will have to wait for that. But that's okay. I can get this clear coated off stream and finished up. And then we will figure out which type of blue geode we will be doing next week. So there will be four more in the series. And then uh, when I get all six of them done, we will. Um, We will hang them uh, on a gallery wall behind me, along with a bunch of my other paintings. And then I think, um, I think I'll put these up in the Etsy store uh, individually rather than as a full set. But I haven't really decided. I think they look gorgeous together, but There's no reason this can't be a standalone painting all by itself. I don't think it needs the full set. I am very, very happy with the depth of this now that we have the line work done. I love this center just as it is. I added nothing to it as far as line work is concerned. But these corners and this depth out here on the outside turned out much better than I would have, would have guessed it would. I'm very, very pleased with how this looks. Definitely a geode painting, right? Like I said, I try to practice telling myself what I love about each piece. There's always something I think I can improve on. And that's easy, right? It's always easy to tell yourself what you can do better. I have to practice telling myself what I did right. but I definitely like it. All right, guys, I think we are gonna get ready to wrap up for today, and I will be back here uh, every Thursday. Um, for the next few Thursdays, we'll be doing more of these acrylic pour paintings. Awesome, Dan. That's cool. Um, and then uh, we'll start a new project. I'm seriously thinking about, uh, about doing a uh, four piece uh, square canvas of uh, seasonal trees. The spring, summer, autumn, and winter. 
So we may start that after this. Thanks so much, Cass. Um, I may just hang out on Twitch today for a little while. I think I might do that. All right, so I will see you guys here hopefully um, next Thursday. In the meantime, uh, Creative Vets has um, a wonderful um, musician and uh, a story songwriting, a storytelling songwriter, uh, Rick. Uh, and you can find him throughout the week on here. Uh, I know that we've had several extremely talented people. I'm not sure who else is up. That's all I've seen on the schedule at creativevets.org. Um, and you can always uh, take a look at their videos on uh, Creative Vets YouTube channel as well. Or go through the website and look at their programs. It's amazing. If you do know any veterans or anybody who would enjoy this or you think this would help, uh, please do invite them to come uh, see the streams. Um, and not necessarily only veterans. Uh, Creative Vets does uh, offer services for veterans. Um, I have noticed that a lot with the live streams, we have people uh, coming in, uh, not necessarily veterans, some people related to veterans. Um, people with anxiety, depression, um, bipolar, PTSD, lots of different things going on that I think this kind of content is really helpful for. Um, so sharing that with them, you know, can only help benefit everybody, right? All right, so thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I do appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next week. If not, um, I will see you around Twitch. Uh, I, of course, am Mrs. Zoe of five. So thanks so much for hanging out with me, guys. We'll see you. We are a nonprofit that's helping combat disabled veterans heal through the arts and music. Our art programs in Chicago and California help combat disabled veterans tell their story through art. We enroll them into the best art institutes in the country. We pay for their tuition, their housing, their food all three weeks so that they can finally tell their story through art. We also bring combat disabled veterans to Nashville, to places and rooms like this here at the Grand Old Opry, to tell their story for the first time with pro songwriters all about the things that they went through that they've never been able to talk about before. These programs have been extremely successful in helping veterans combat their PTSD. Right now, Creative Vets has more veterans applying for our programs than we do funding. So if you can go to creativevets.org and donate, we would appreciate it.